Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. We've previously looked at the idea of linear time invariant systems, particularly characterizing them by a frequency response we've called big H j omega. If we put e to the j omega naught t into the system, this is a complex valued sinusoid with a real part that's a cosine and an imaginary part that's a sine. We'll get out the same complex sinusoid, e to the j omega naught t, except we're going to multiply it by the frequency response evaluated at omega naught. We'll think about what happens when we put a real valued sinusoid in the system, which we'll represent as a cosine with frequency omega naught, amplitude a, and phase phi. In a future lecture, we'll see how we can use Fourier transform theory to write the Fourier transform of this function, multiply it by the frequency response, which is the Fourier transform of the impulse response, and then invert the Fourier transform on the other side. We could also avoid using that complicated Fourier transform theory and just rewrite this cosine using Euler's formula. But here, I'm going to use a bit of a trick. I'm going to use a phasor style representation of this cosine, where I will write it as the real part of a phasor a times e to the j phi times e to the j omega naught t. And this will allow me to figure out the output fairly simply, assuming the impulse response h of n is real valued. I'm going to write the output as the real part of the input, this a e to the j phi e to the j omega naught t times where what's inside of the real part is multiplied by big H j omega naught. So notice I've exchanged the order of applying the real part and the system. On the left, I apply the real part first, and then I apply the system. On the right, I apply the system first, and then I apply the real part. This may give you the impression that I'm treating taking the real part as a linear time invariant operation, since it's a thing that generally lets me swap the order of operations. But I should put in a caveat here. Taking the real part is not a linear operation. It's sort of kind of acts like one, but when you deal with complex valued quantities, you can get into trouble. The thing that allows you to do the swapping here is the assumption that h of n is real. If you think for a second about what it would look like to compute a convolution with a complex quantity, because h of n is real, I could think about rewriting this complex input here as a real part plus a j imaginary part. And because convolution is a linear operation, I could apply that convolution separately to the real part and the imaginary part. And the convolution operation with the real part will give me real numbers. And then I'll just have this j sitting here, and the convolution between the imaginary part and the impulse response would give me imaginary values. So what's real and what's imaginary will sort of be maintained across that transition. So it allows me to flip taking the real part around. I can get rid of the imaginary part at the beginning or get rid of the imaginary part at the end, and I'll get the same thing other way. But on the other hand, if h of n was complex valued, then I will get some crosstalk, so to speak, between the real and imaginary parts. So let's figure out what comes out here. Big H of j omega can be written as a magnitude times e to the j phase of big H of j omega. To save space, let me move this up here. So all of the stuff here is equal to real part of, so by the rules of complex numbers, we'll multiply the magnitudes together, and then we'll multiply the e to the j phases together, which then corresponds to adding. So we can write this as e to the j phi plus big H j omega naught. And then all of this in here is times e to the j omega naught t. And then I'll close the real part bracket here. Let's see, let me not forget to close the magnitude here. So when I take the real part of this complex exponential, I wind up with big H j omega naught magnitude times a cosine omega naught t plus phi plus angle of j omega naught. So a cosine went in and a cosine came out. The cosine has the same frequency, but what's happened to the amplitude? Well, the amplitude got multiplied by the magnitude of the frequency response evaluated at omega naught, and then the phase had something added to it, namely the angle of the 
frequency response evaluated at the frequency omega naught. Cosine in, cosine out. We define the frequency response of a system as the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the impulse response against e to the minus j omega t dt. Not coincidentally, this looks like a generic Fourier transform, which we defined using the exact same form. So unsurprisingly, Fourier transforms and frequency responses are highly related concepts. The frequency response is really just the Fourier transform of the impulse response. So let's do a particular example using this cosine and cosine out property we just derived. So remember the general idea. If we have a cosine omega naught t plus phi going into the system, then the amplitude of the wave a gets multiplied by the frequency response's magnitude evaluated at omega naught. And what happens to the phase? Well, we add to it the angle of the frequency response evaluated at the frequency going in. So let's do an example. Suppose the input to the system is 6 cosine 40 pi t plus pi over 3. And suppose the impulse response is a decaying exponential of the form e to the minus 50 t ut. I'm often fond of asking students questions on exams where I'll ask them to convolve x with h, and if they immediately start writing down a convolution integral, I know they've missed the point of the problem. What I want them to see is that this is an input, this is an impulse response, so convolution is what you do to find the output from an input and an impulse response. So I want them to see that because a sinusoid is going into a system, they shouldn't try convolution directly. They should use frequency response concepts. In a previous lecture, we determined what the Fourier transform of a decaying exponential was, and it looked a little something like this. It was 1 over j omega plus, we called it a at the time, is basically what this 50 here is, so a write in 50. And now what I need to do to finish the problem is I need to evaluate the frequency response at the frequency going in, which here is 40 pi. So I'm going to plug 40 pi in for omega, and that gives me 1 over j 40 pi plus 50. I think the best thing to do is go ahead and pull out a calculator. In this case, I'm going to pull out Octave, which is an open source rewrite of MATLAB, which I'll basically use as a glorified calculator. So z is equal to j times 40 times pi plus 50, just so I have something to call this complex number. This is actually the denominator, so let me divide it by 1. There we go. Now I will ask it for the absolute value, and now I will ask it for its angle. It's traditional to write phases as multiples of pi, so let me take that number and divide it by pi. So this is like 0 0.007394, I'm being a little pedantic with the number of significant digits, times e to the j, the phase in terms of pi, which is a minus... 0.37946. And remember, we're going to add this to the phase that's going in, which was pi over 3. Let me take this number here and add one third to it because everything here is in terms of times pi. And then I'll take the amplitude going in, which is 6, and multiply it by the magnitude, which is this 0.007394. And I get out a really tiny number, like 0.044. So the output has magnitude 0 0.044, I'll round it there, times cosine 40 pi t, the frequency does not change, and then I'll have a phase of minus 0 0.38, let's round it there, times pi. Cosine in, cosine out.